Hey, we're back. It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 34. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the headlines in creationism from the past week, or in this case, the past two weeks, or let's say the last three weeks. So what do we got coming up? Well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna ask the question, do we need another creation museum? All right. Is there another creation museum around the block? And what does that mean for creationist organizations, this sort of competition for viewers? Let's discuss that. But we also want to talk about answers in Genesis, still fumbling around trying to figure out what the difference is between a bird and a dinosaur. The only thing they know is that birds aren't dinosaurs. But the question is, can they figure out exactly how a bird isn't a dinosaur? Can they actually identify or define what a dinosaur is and exclude birds from their description. Let's look at a recent article from Mantris and Genesis on that question. And I also want to talk about the author of that particular article um, because I think it's, um, I, I want to introduce you to a new PhD scientist at Answers in Genesis um, and tell you a little bit about her and her background. Then let's talk a little killer whales, uh, Venus flytraps, and a whole bunch more. So we've got that coming up next. Yeah, I'm back. It's been a while. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I've got an eclectic set of stuff that uh, I want to cover. Um, and we're going to kick it off with um, talking about some creation museums. Now, I was I was thinking about creation museums uh, just a few weeks ago because I had seen this uh, announcement from Institute for Creation Research and their ICR Discovery Center, which, remember, is uh, one of the newest creation museums on the block. And although this so this announcement kind of surprised me, it's kind of like third anniversary, and, and that really hit me because it just feels like the other day this place opened. The other thing that hit me about this was, I thought, three years. And what do I know about the ICR Discovery Center? What have I learned about it? Like, how much have I heard about the ICR Discovery Center in the past three years? And uh, what could I say about it? And so here's what I can say I've heard about it and know about it. Yeah, okay, that's it, right? I don't know anything about the ICR Discovery Center. I don't know how many people have visited um, I don't know um, how it's perceived by other young earth creationists. I don't really know what the reactions are of people who have visited it. I can hardly find any reviews of it. I remember discussing uh, and writing about uh, the Discovery Center when it was first announced that they were building one. And I'd speculated at the time, I said, you know, are there enough, are there enough clients out there? Uh, you know, are there enough people who want to go to a creation museum that will, that will, you know, Put out the dollars to go to a place like this and our creation is spreading those dollars too thin because you've got the creation museum in kentucky you've got uh the ark encounter uh, and now you have this discovery center down in texas my perception is that it's a very local thing all right it has not become a national or international known entity and that it kind of serves the greater uh, dallas fort worth area not that that isn't a really large area but um, there, there can't possibly be the, the type of audience that they're bringing in that, say, the Creation Museum is, which is, you know, between the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, we're looking around, you know, maybe around somewhere around a million uh, visitors a year. Um, and the ICR Discovery Center isn't nearly that size, but nonetheless, there was a lot of hype for it originally by ICR. And the thing that I, as I reflect and think about the last couple of years, I think about how many times have I heard about the Discovery Center. Well, I said, I barely heard about it at all. Well, then that makes me uh, realize what the contrast is between ICR and Answers in Genesis. You know, what's the difference between these two museums, really? The difference is um, the, I, the, the Discovery Center doesn't have a spokesperson, right? They don't have that consummate uh, salesperson. And Answers in Genesis does, right? They've got Ken Ham. Ken Ham is the ultimate promoter. Right. He's great at marketing. Um, he posts 
every single day some kind of picture or some kind of like we had so many people here or this thing is going on at the ark encounter or look at this animal or we have uh you know we have this person coming or here i am taking a selfie with this uh congressman or whatever that just came to visit or this country western star and you know and it makes it seem like there's something going on there all the time right can't miss it gotta go Right. And you got to go back over and over again because we're now building this new carousel and you haven't ever seen that before. So you got to see that next. Right. The marketing is truly it's it's top notch for Ark Encounter and for the Creation Museum. Um, and it's not just, you know, Ken Ham does that on his personal uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I don't know what else that I'm not on that he's doing. Um, and he is, he, but there's also a Twitter and a Facebook and a, and a, um, uh, you know, Instagram page for the museum and for the Ark Encounter and Answers in Genesis has all that. So they're, they're hitting this up on multiple different social media fronts every single day. Uh, it's a constant barrage. And what do I hear from ICR? Uh, eh, we got a third anniversary coming up once a week. There's something they say about the, the museum. It's just, it's not very much. It's very underwhelming. And that gives me the impression that um, it hasn't been wildly successful it, from a, you know, total number of visitors monetary uh, standpoint. I just don't really know how it's, how it's surviving. I, I might be wrong, but I don't understand why they don't hype it up if, and, and talk about it if, if it's not actually being successful. And actually, if it's not being successful, you need to hype it up and talk about it because you're not going to get anyone to come if, if people don't know about it. Um, yeah, that, I don't think they had the budget and the marketing people to be able to do as much um, because Ken Ham's not writing all these posts and putting all these things on Instagram and all that. I mean, he has handlers that are like scheduling these things and so forth. But but you get the idea. It's it's they have a marketing plan um, behind it. OK. We don't need to talk about the Discovery Center anymore because, like I said, I don't really know that much about it. I wish I did know more about it, but I can't tell you much more about it because I never hear about it. But I did hear about a new creation museum. Not necessarily called a creation museum, sort of a, uh, you know, a creation discovery place, uh, a, a, a semi-museum and a learning center, along with corporate center for um, David Rives Ministries. And so David Rives, or possibly it's Reeves, and I just realized that I, I should know how to pronounce his last name, but I don't, so I apologize. I'm going to say Rives, but I, I might be wrong about that. Uh, I haven't really ever paid a lot of attention to David Rives. You think, well, I follow a lot of creation scientists, um, and but I, but I haven't talked about him. I think maybe I've done one post about something he said, and I've made one video that, that makes mention of... of of just a really bad take he has on something. Uh, but but David Reeves has a he's a totally self-made um, promoter of creation science. Right. It's just, you know, it, it, when you, I don't know anything about his education because he's not posted anywhere. I can't find anywhere that that knows anything about his his qualifications. He writes about himself and his story of how he came to have this idea for David Reeves Ministries. Uh, and that is that he was, he's an amateur astronomer. He loves astronomy, um, having read many astronomy books. And um, he was looking in the sky one day and, you know, he's really hit by, you know, other people just have to see this, you know, because they're going to know about God if they see the, you know, the stars the way I do. And so he started to travel around with his telescope, give talks at churches. Uh, and this is only back in, I think, 2007, uh, I believe. And not long after that, he created David Reeves Ministries, which is in Tennessee. And he uh, he's in like a 12,000 square foot um, facility now where he has a television studio. He does all kinds of recordings and he's now talking to hundreds and hundreds of people. Right. Uh, I mean, going out and giving talks, but he's also reaching a lot of people because he has like a podcast. and He's got. Oh, let me go to this next page. He's got this. He's got a, a whole uh, plethora, all right, of different web pages, all under the supervisory umbrella of David Reeves Ministries, which just seems to be David Reeves. Um, 
I mean, he's hired a bunch of people, but this is his brainchild. And so he has a bookstore. He's got website, websites for searching and uh, learning about creation science. He's got blogs. He's got this creation science minute, which is a, a minute little blurb about creation science. It would be like you might hear if you're listening to Christian radio. Um, and so it goes on. This is just a sh short snapshot of all the different individual web pages he has under different web page names that are all under this larger umbrella of David Reeves Ministries. And he has created all this himself. He's a very, you know, a fairly polished speaker, I'd say. He has very good equipment. Um, you know, so he's got great recordings. It's very, but, but what it is, the reason I haven't paid a lot of attention to him is because I've called him a fringe creationist in the sense that He's not a generator of new, you know, as we'd say in science, um, and scientists are looking to try to generate new knowledge, right? Push the field forward in, in their field. David Rees isn't pushing the field of creation science forward anywhere. He's not really doing any form of research. And I wouldn't, I don't think of him as having any like synthesis thoughts that synthesize, I can't say the word, synthesize things. Right. In other words, he's not taking other creationist work and saying, like, I can improve upon these ideas with, with new hypothesis, hypotheses. He's pretty much just creationist said this, you know, all these other people doing this work and writing this stuff. I read it and then I just spout it out to you and I make videos in which I just here's all the things I remember. The problem I have with David Reeves is that um, and a lot of fringe creationists is, is they read other creation science material. They don't fully grasp it really because they don't have the educational background and experience to be able to, to understand uh, a lot of what's written there. And of course, I'm also skeptical of a lot of creation science literature because there's some decent literature and then there's really bad literature. And somebody like David Reeves can't necessarily distinguish between, you know, very awful, <laughs> you know, completely erroneous material, like factually wrong material versus factually correct, but I disagree with their their position or, or uh, interpretation. Um, Dave Reeves just kind of sucks it all in, all right, from everywhere. Maybe doesn't even realize some of the controversies uh, that exist and just sort of picks out pieces of data that he thinks sounds great, then just kind of packages them together into his own videos. And when that happens, you tend to also embellish and uh, exaggerate things, all right, for greater effect. He does have kind of that, that, that style of, of traveling salesman type thing going on there. And so whatever was already bad about the creation science literature, he just kind of amplifies the badness of it, right, making it into, into something that's just, just a little bit way out there sometimes. So he's easy to criticize in terms of like, uh, you have no idea what you're talking about on this particular topic. All right, so I would just say he's like on the fringes. I don't think that um, other young earth creationist organizations really, they, they're fine with him because he, for one thing, he's selling their books, right? And um, he's not serious competition for a lot of speaking engagements. So Answers in Genesis is, you know, the main organization that's going to gobble up most of the speaking opportunities. And, you know, there's a few around the fringes and David Rees has his own, you know, he has his own network of, of places he's gone and kind of can get into and types of churches that he speaks at. And so there's this, you know, there's, I mean, creationist organizations are interesting because they are in kind of competition with each other for both resources in terms of donation dollars. The more places you speak, the more places that identify you as a creationist they want to donate to, the larger your footprint might be. The thing about David Reeves that I don't really understand is his his funding. I mean, he doesn't have a huge base, I think, of individual followers, but he clearly has some important followers that have deep pockets because he has um, he has great equipment and he does a lot. So he's able to employ people to do all the technical stuff uh, that make him look very professional, even though he's just like I said, he's just totally like self-made from just like I had this idea for looking up in the sky for David Reeves ministry. And then I just did it right. I just started making it. And I started going out and giving talks. And I, he just he has that he has that Ken Hamish um, ability to self-promote. He's a really good self-promoter, talks about himself, talks about what he does and uh, and, and is just pushy. All right. And, and so he is he's created what appears to be a very large network of stuff. I don't think a lot of these websites really have that much traffic. 
But the appearance from the outside is that there's a lot of activity, a lot of things going on with David Reeves. But nonetheless, so I've kind of just like, okay, there he is. He's doing his thing. He's just a repackager. But then comes this announcement that he is creating something called the Wonders Center um, um, and Science Museum. And the Wonders Center is a uh, building that he has bought uh, in a small town southwest of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and the building used to be called the Renaissance Center. And the Renaissance Center is a place where the, the, I think, uh, what was it? Um, I'm trying to remember now. The Jackson Fellowship or Company or something like that. Some philanthropist uh, put up a ton of money to build this very large building. All right, 112,000 square foot building that has a planetarium, uh, huge atrium. And then they held uh, various arts classes in there and community events, uh, had plays and shows and so forth uh, in the 2000s. But eventually, I don't know what happened, but eventually they gave it, they gifted it to a uh, community college. And then the community college was just using part of the facility uh, for an extension of the community college. Uh, then those uh, destructive um, uh, tornadoes that struck Nashville came through this particular area and took a portion of the roof and knocked some windows out. Planetariums damaged. They have a lot of water damage uh, in the facility. And so the, the college tried to sell the place. Um, and they were trying to sell it for seven and a half million dollars, but couldn't find a buyer. And so they're going to put it up for auction uh, this year. But before it went to the actual auction, uh, David Reeves came along and uh, I guess gave them an offer they couldn't refuse. Uh, and has bought this facility. And so they're going to move their 12,000 foot square uh, operation to this over 100,000 square foot building uh, and create the Wonder Center. Um, and if you go to this Wonder Center website, he's got all these pictures of what it's going to look like. And it's impressive if he gets to that point. Um, and he's claiming in a video he just put out that this is going to be the largest you know, creation museum uh, of its type. Uh, in the world. And, you know, Nashville's not that far away from Kentucky, right? Northern Kentucky. And so there you got Ken Ham up there with his Creation Museum. And now you're going to have Nashville, like the center of the Bible Belt here. And you've got this massive Creation Museum and Learning Center and Science Center, along with the uh, operation for his uh, the rest of his ministries, all heading out of this building. Anyway, if you'd like to see this come to fruition, you are, I guess, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'd be happy if you would, but you can decide if you would like to donate to it. It looks like they have a few donations. They've only collected, what, for the main building, they want to collect another $3.4 million to renovate it. And they've got 353000 as of today. And uh, the planetarium also needs repairs. And so they're estimating another $2.1 million for that. So they're looking for another $5 million. Now, I'm assuming they paid a $1 million, $2 million, $3 million for this building. Um, where did he get that money? I mean, he must have, must have a big donor um, behind him that's buying this stuff uh, for him. But otherwise, this is a significant... Um, uh, operation. I mean, the creation, this is really is on the par of what the Creation Museum was when the, the building of the original Creation Museum in Kentucky. I think this is real competition because I think David Reeves is a master marketer. And I think with a structure like this, and um, he's going to, he, he's going to build this out, I think. And I, I, I think he must have the kind of resources to be able to do a little something with it. Although, Obviously, he wants other people to join in with him here uh, to help offset some of the costs. Um, I think other creationist organizations are going to have to pay attention to, to David Reeves because of this. Um, he is young, right? He's an up-and-coming creationist promoter star, all right? And eventually, I think he's going to attract some attention, the attention being maybe some other creation scientists who come in and give him some legitimacy in terms of maybe, you know, just like Ken Ham getting some PhDs to come, you know, be at the museum and, you know, play around on the side with some things and publish some articles. Uh, you know, it could become that kind of thing. I think we might be seeing the beginnings of a nascent sort of 
uh, birth of a new creationist organization that might be able to rival something like Answers in Genesis. And, and as I've spoken of before, the, the fate of Answers in Genesis really lies in the transition between Ken Ham and whoever comes next. Um, sure, they have the resources, they've got facilities, um, but it's the constant promotion and the name of Ken Ham that, uh, that is the thing that actually makes Answers in Genesis continue. And without that the you know whether they'll have a charismatic leader that will be able to carry them forward is something i've always wondered about and i've always thought they might have enough inertia that it doesn't matter because i don't see any other charismatic leaders out there in the other organizations but now you have this david reeves thing showing up and uh yeah they're it's it's possible i'll just say that it's possible that david reeves is kind of the next ken ham and the next major player on the on the creationist scene now uh, due to the fact that he has this facility. Well, I was going to say I have a lot of other things to cover and I need to get to some other uh, science stories, but I feel like I've probably been talking about this for, oh, what, a solid 20, 25 minutes now about creation ministries and David Rives and so forth. And so maybe I'm just going to leave it here for this episode um, and then I will um, record the other material as the next episode of This Week in Creationism, which won't take a whole nother week, hopefully, to come out. Um, so is there anything else I can say about creation museums and, um, and I guess, leadership of creation organizations? Because that's sort of what I'm talking about is that the different directions that creation organizations are taking. Yeah, what I think I could do is I think I'll just skip down to my last um, uh, slide, uh, which has a couple what I thought were fun items about uh, Ken Ham. But I think I can make a couple points that relate to this creation museum stuff. Um, so quick preview of what's coming up in the next uh, this week in creationism ready don't 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 yep there we go uh, orcas uh, CET here we are um, yeah I saw this tweet from Ken Ham like I said he, Ken Ham tweets constantly uh, and I think it's this past Sunday and he says on Sundays the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum Open at 1 p.m. so staff can attend their churches. This Labor Day weekend on Sunday, thousands poured into the Ark Creation, Ark and Creation Museum. What a beautiful day, starting with bright sunshine and ending with a beautiful sunset. To which you can see I replied. And my reply was this, because I, I don't very often reply to Ken Ham. Um, I just generally don't reply to other creation scientists on their social media. I'm not there to... To ruffle feathers or and I don't believe usually that you know snarky comments or or responses that aren't even snarky but like accurate comments that reflect some factual problem that that, that they're saying really do any good um, and so that's not where my effort is placed um, but I couldn't help myself but write a comment uh, to this one because it's it's a little thing that kind of bothers me about the creation museum uh, and it bothers me because of my own background and my own um, belief in the Sabbath day being kept separate from other days. Uh, and so I wrote this, the message, laboring on the Sabbath is fine as long as you squeeze in some church somewhere. Six days shall thou labor and the Sabbath dot, dot, dot. Well, that's, I'm quoting the verse from Exodus 29 through 11, but also Exodus 34 through 21. Um, the point being that you work for six days and then you rest on the seventh. That God has set the Sabbath day aside and separate from the other six days. And that's the day we rest in God's word rather than work. Now, I think that Ken Ham probably doesn't see the Creation Museum as being work because he sees it as part of his ministry. Um, and that's why he's kind of he's saying, because I've made this point to him and others as organization in the past. Um, he's 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 that they're making people work. On the Sabbath, and it's not a necessary work. It's not a necessary job, uh, and and many of these people are are hard pressed probably to get to church, you know, that morning. And I don't really view Sunday as just being something you do for two hours, you know, in the morning, and then you go on and like here's this whole other day where you can work and labor and do other things that you need to get done. Um, and yet this is the way Ken Ham is kind of treating. It's like hey, they can get their church time in. Right. You know, so they're they're still being godly 
and then they can come work at the Creation Museum, which, of course, in his mind is, is a godly work in a sense. He, I'm sure, thinks it's necessary. Um, but is it necessary? I mean, the, 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 the problem is, is that it's a good day to attract uh, people coming there. Although, see, I would quibble with Christians who think that that's a good day to go to the Creation Museum, um, to pay money, to get other people to work for them and serve them, you know, in this environment. Um, uh, but he's, he's making money on that day, right? I mean, he, he kind of needs that Sabbath day because Christians have lost the sense of the Sabbath day. They now are more entrained to say, no, this is, this is something I can do on the Sabbath. And so he's following the world's pattern. <laughs> okay. You see where I'm going? He's complaining all the time about us bowing down to, you know, then capitulating to culture. Uh, and yet here he is accommodating culture, uh, having his employees accommodate the culture of the day in order to make enough money to keep this thing alive. You know, he's probably justifying, like, uh, you know, we're keeping it open on Sabbath. I'm sure he's justifying it in his mind mentally that this is a good work, but there, there also has to be a component of a lot of our money comes from that particular day. Right. If we weren't open on the Sabbath, would we be a continuing operation? Right. If we just did Saturday, you know, I've heard him many times talk about how great um, uh, like Chick-fil-A is. Right. Because they they don't make their employees work on the Sabbath. Right. They're closed on Sunday and yet he can't close on Sunday. Right. He has to be open on Sunday. Right. To, to get, and yet Chick-fil-A is a very successful business. Right. Shouldn't he look at it as I can be closed on the Sabbath and God will bless me for doing the right thing. All right. For allowing my employees and all those to truly rest in the Sabbath day. Right. I don't I don't discount the fact that there are individuals that come there and they are enjoying their time and they're they're in a in an environment where they're learning about God's word. I disagree with what's being taught about God's word there, but they're learning about God's word and so forth. And I don't think it's, I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I'm not upset with people who would go there that day, but I don't think that they should be given the option of being able to go there that day. Because I think Ken Ham should view this as uh, a day set aside, not for doing business, right? The whole day doesn't say in the Bible, thou shalt spend a quarter of a day, you know, in service and in and, and, uh, uh, reflection to God. It says, six days shalt thou labor, and then on the Sabbath do no work. All right, you rest on the Sabbath day. All right, so that's my, that's my quibble when I hear about all this stuff where he's like promoting how many people. And this is why he's saying he's, a, he's the consummate promoter, constantly telling us like how many people are there, how wonderful it is, how awesome it is. You got to get down here, bring your buses, bring your kids. Kids are free. We'll get, you know, it's, it, it's all promotion. And it's promotion for, I, I, I know some people are very, sar um, uh, not sarcastic, they're skeptical. And they think it's, it's all about the money. I, I, I really don't think that about Answers in Genesis. I've, I've seen their you know, tax forms and so forth. They're not overpaying people for the jobs they're doing. This is not a giant money laundering system. I mean, it's laundering money from donors, but they're freely giving their money and they're not wasting those donors' dollars. They're not out on yachts. They're not, uh, you know, they are putting it all back into the ministry. I, I agree to that. This is not a wasteful ministry in that sense. Uh, nonetheless, um, it, it, you know, so uh, yeah, going back to what I was saying, Ken, Ken Ham is is uh, sincerely, you know, wanting to minister and do these things, but there is just this business aspect there which really can't escape your mind, right? You know, to be successful, you have to be open on Sunday, or at least he thinks you have to be open on Sunday. And my challenge would be, if this is something that God is uh, truly happy with, right? We talk about how. If you do what is right, God will bless you. Uh, and so if it's right not to be open on the Sabbath, God will bless that. 
you don't have to make your own plans for how to be successful. All right, second little item here. And this, again, reflects the um, persona, all right, and who Ken Ham is. Um, he posted this just a day or two ago. You know, while in Florida, I had some spare time between speaking engagements, meetings, and so forth. So I looked up the word vacation and decided to try it for two hours. And you see what the implication there is? He never stops working. I and mean, really, he doesn't. He's, a, he's a, 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 a man on a mission with a one-track mind. Um, he has no sense of humor. There's no time for watching sports or doing any other kind of, of activity. I mean, he has shown himself going to like, you know, he has kids and grandkids and they do things and he spends time doing those. He, he does do those things. But it's almost like that's taking away from my, you know, from my, my real mission here, you know, my real work. Um, and so it's just sort of like this, oh, look, I'm actually on vacation. I spent two hours doing this thing and I had to look up what it is because I don't even know what a vacation is because I don't do vacations. I'm working for you. See, I'm, I'm, I'm constant. I'm, I'm focused on the word. And I think it's fine for people to, to be like that. That's okay if he's, I mean, that's an admirable quality in, in many ways. I think when it slips into, um, where it slips into pride is where you begin to feel like that's what everybody else should be doing. And you can hear that in the way he talks. It's like you're wasting your life if you're doing X, Y, and Z because you could be doing this ministry. And I think that's the same thing with like going back to being open on the Sabbath. Um, it's like it's so this important. This, this work is so important. My work is so critical and so important. I have to make it available to everybody at almost every moment. I'm, I'm almost... I almost have to have an excuse for not being open on Sunday morning, right? I'll get too much criticism for that because people, my workers won't be able to get to church so they can do some Sabbath then. I'll say, you know, if you can just do Sabbath in a couple hours, you know, in the morning, then why not be like the Catholics and do some Sabbath on Saturday evening or something or give them the option. They can do it any time of the weekend. Then you can be open all the time as long as they can squeeze in, uh, you know, an hour of church great then they're fine right they've they've put in their church time um so 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 what happens is is that he's he 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 can be very critical of other christians who are not spending their time in in sort of the focused way that he is um but god has given other people different gifts and different ways to motivate themselves and different energies to do different things um, not everybody can be exactly like uh, Ken Ham. All right, so I think uh, I think now that's it. Um, let's stop here, and then I will come back, and then on the next episode, I'll talk about birds and dinosaurs, a uh, new PhD that has come to work at Answers in Genesis. We'll get into the, uh, the orcas, uh, continuous environmental tracking, um, you know, what else? Oh, the Hubble, uh, not the Hubble, the, the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, I'm sure a couple other things that will probably pop up in the next day that I'll toss in for episode number 35. So thanks for listening. Again, my name's Joel Duff. And hey, subscribe to my channel if you aren't already. And uh, you'll then know when episode number 35 is out. And uh, join me for that one. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.